thing that has to be across this, especially not on Rev 1, Rev 2, right? So you try to think, what can we really take across here as Rev 1.0? And one way to help these brains and this angst is go back here and say, you know what, we're going to map out those. We got Rev 1.2, we got Rev 1.5, we got Rev 2.0, we're thinking of Rev 3.0. Put them right back over here to this guy. Probably make me very excited. Now I got more stuff to work on. Don't have to worry about Rev 1. So that's, that's one transitional point. Very painful stage, this development design freeze. And something very important to think about next week when we talk about the org chart and where do you fit in this. Very rare for someone to transition the whole way um, effectively. So we we've, have we've some feasibility going here. We are going to now start getting out in the world. We don't want to just sell one of these. We don't want to just produce them on Wednesdays. We are hoping to uh, run a, an organization, whether that's manufacturing, service, whatever it is. We don't want to just sell one for all kinds of Swiss franc. We want to get, get now this working to a bunch of people. So part of that is the sales bag, right? We have to try to scale up the, the selling and the value and the person who can talk about the value. So early on, this person's going to be the best one to talk about it. They know it. They've got all kinds of passion. They can get a couple of their friends to buy they, because they know it. They know it inside and out. But in scaling up a business, we have to really find out how to transition some of that passion into a sales force or an indirect sales reps or into another company that might partner with us to distribute. And how are those people going to take the passion? And how can we mechanize our sales brochure so that somebody who doesn't have a lifelong passion, they just have a job. And their job is to sell and they're very happy to sell. How can we give them the story to tell. So we have to think how to mechanize that, not only just the sales force though, but it's also the distribution, the manufacturing. It has to work, has to start costing a low amount, you know, pennies and instead of dollars. And the yields have to be high percentage of yields. So it has to work every day of the week, 24 seven, or however 24 seven means to you to scale up um, and take your quality that you need in a repeatable manner. This, thought of as the scale-up phase. There's a couple of things that are really critical early on to say, do I have a startup company, right? We, we define this as startup company. Start <coughs> up company. But you know, that brings up a unique question. How do you know when a startup company is a startup company? And some of these slogans that we use, we don't, they're really fuzzier. So uh, how many of the teams here have a startup company? Do you have a, a startup company? No. Oh, no. No. Not a startup company? OK. And where's, where's Rudolph? Oh, there. Startup company? OK. Why don't you have a startup company? idea champions, what, what does it take so that you could say, oh yeah, I do have a startup company now? What do you need to answer that question? When is a startup company a startup company? Seems like a really easy question. It is hard to answer, but what do you think? Once it's registered. There you go. Register it, and then you got it. Easy. 100 bucks, you go down, you say you're registered, and now you have a startup company. Sounds pretty simple. What else? You're right, though. Registering would be part of it. What else? When do you have a... Is that all you have to do is just register it, and then you can say, yeah, I have a startup company. Investment. Investment. Might need some money coming in, right? Yeah. Need a product. Need a product. That so, so do you have to be able to sell a product to be a startup company? That means we, we don't really have a startup company until we're over here, because we can't really start selling until we're over here. Okay, good questions. What else do you need? We've thought, we missed a few pieces. I want to draw a few sketches here of the short list of what I think we need. Yes? I think you should have already the key from this engine. Already. The 
key of the engine. Well, what do you think is the key of the engine? I like the figurative artwork. Uh, what does the key mean? Potential customers, okay. That, you, that they're, they're already done? So that means we really don't have a startup company until we're here then. If we gotta actually finish them all, maybe we have a solid plan. I like the thinking, we, we feel we know how we're gonna get them all done. Any other thoughts? There's you one other right word. People. What? You need the right people. There we go, that was the only other one I was personally looking for. You know, there's a, a long list, but the right people. So. Um, if, if we really say, you know, do I have a startup company, yes or no, right? Here we go. Here we go. Do I have a startup company, yes or no? Uh, how do you answer that? Well, first thing to do, you know what I want you all to do, is first of all, the main thing is you declare it. You just state that you have a startup company, and then you do. So the next time somebody bumps into you on the street, you might just say, I'm actually, I'm working on a startup company. Really, that's cool, because you just say you are, because it's quite fuzzy when you really have one. Now, if you're still saying that 10 years from now and you have not made any progress, all right, well, you're not too serious about your startup company, but step one is just declare it. I have a startup company. No one can really take that away from you. But let's just talk about some of the things that are pretty critical. Number one, startup companies have to have a leader. They have to have someone who is leading them, a champion, an interim CEO, a startup CEO, or the CEO. You know, they need a team. And the, the main person that is leading that has to have a very strange power. They have to have the ability to see the invisible. They have to be able to see down into the future all the way through a lot of fuzz and a lot of potential changes way out here to a world that's very different. They have to really envision this, and they have to own it like a, a dream that's so clear they can see it. And they ha hopefully have the experience to know, I know how we go through this, I know how we go through this, I have done this before, I can see it. Okay, they also have to have some flexibility. They cannot be completely rigid to just go forward. They may have to shift, and they have to know when to shift and when to change or shape their idea or pivot, many words for it. But if we're pivoting and shaping all the time, uh, we don't get past here. So we, uh, we have to have this secret ingredient to envision that future. And part of that is this, this a very good plan and a business plan. We'll talk about a business plan in a minute, but some kind of a plan, and more importantly from that plan, how do you turn the plan into action steps, doable action steps, usually with less people than you wanted and less money than you wanted, but some way to figure out how can we move toward this. And speaking of the people, have to be able to tell the story in such a way that it's not one person anymore. It's a small group of people and then that, that group of people gets a little bit bigger and they're all pretty excited. You know, they're, they're cheering in one way or another to say, yeah, I'm on the team, or I'm helping the team, or I'm going to give a little money to the team. That's one story you have to tell to get, get your money. And they're all like, yay, yeah, yay, yeah, this is great. They're even saying, wow, in one way or another. Or you have to convince some of your friends to quit their jobs and stop getting a paycheck. Or you have to convince them to maybe help you on Saturdays. Or help them, convince them to be a beta customer. Would you please try this out? No one has ever bought one of these yet. Please be a beta customer for us. So a lot of convincing, a lot of good storytelling, and, and getting people engaged. Also, have to have, you have to have some form of equipment. Now that might be different for each of you, but it's, it's a piece that we want you to consider in this breakout, in the uh, breakouts, one of the breakout sessions, is how much do you really need to get your factory going? You know, if you're gonna be an incorporated company of some kind, what does your building look like? How much can you do virtually? How much do you need right away? How much, uh, because at some point, you can't keep working at the university laboratory, though those are wonderful places to get started. You can only go so far. You're probably trying to be a profit, for-profit entity. And universities, in general, are all not-for-profit. So they can help a little bit, but they, they really can't. And you have to work with Tech Transfer to figure out what you own. What does the company own? What comes off campus and into your own laboratory? And when you start inventing new things, does the university still own it, or is it now moved into here and these people? So you have to have your equipment, 
and your facilities to get going. You always have to have money that was mentioned and you never have enough. So you always have to keep asking for, for more money. And it's actually good, and we'll talk about it a little on the second day, it's good to not have enough money in general. And it's well proven that just having lots of money does not mean you're going to have a successful company. There are plenty of failed companies, even to the tune of 60, 80, 100 million dollars that, that have failed. So just having money is not necessarily the answer. And you'll almost always get it in little tranches. We'll show you more about that on, on day two. So there's what you have to have to say, I'm a startup company. You've got to believe and state it, and then you really need to start building up these pieces. <coughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to shift back now to the, to the back of the mind of, of our wow guy, consciously, probably, at least subconsciously. He's a, he's a creative person. He has a lot of ideas. And that's going to come up as an important trait a few times here. But let's just think of all humans in general, for all of humanity. And humans are doing something that's really incredible compared to any other species that we know. You know, the, the dogs don't do this, and the, the plants don't do it very well, and, the, and, the, and the, even the rocks and things like that, and, and the planets. And we don't think that they do this as proactively as we do of humans. We are proactively managing this graph overall. And it has these two axes on it. Quality of blank length of blank. Who can think of one word that goes in both of those, the same word, and it is the source of every single one of the ideas humans have had so far. Raluca is correct for five points. <clears throat> the quality of life, the length of life. And we are trying 